Hi, my name is Shannon Rowe and I'm the chairperson for the first session. So welcome to Broken Promises, the British Empire and the Palestine Mandate. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers and would like to thank everyone for participating. The conference is in partnership with Ed Chill's International Centre on Racism, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sarah Irving. Dr. Irving is a Labour Hall Early Career Fellow at Edge Hill and the Editor-in-Chief of the journal Contemporary Levant. Dr. Irving has published widely on the Palestine Mandate and today is going to speak on donations and their destinations in the 1927 Palestine earthquake. Dr. Irving will be speaking for about 25 minutes and then we're going to open the session up to, for, uh, sorry, to questions from our attendees. As we're going, feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A boxes. Uh, so it's over to you, Dr. Irving, when you're ready. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you to the uh, third year Palestine Mandate class at Edge Hill who have done a fantastic job um, of putting together this conference, um, of publicizing it, of organizing it, um, certainly from the, the back end of things, of, of having interacted with them over the last few weeks or months. Um, they've been um, extremely organized and could have some things to teach um, some much more experienced and senior um, uh, conference organizers. Um, so yes, I am going to be speaking on um, don donations and their destinations, charity and race thinking after the 1927 Palestine earthquake. Um, this is part of my wider Leverhulme uh, project on the social history of the 1927 Jericho earthquake in Palestine. And there we are. Okay, right. PowerPoint is now going to work. Um, so just to give a little bit of background on the earthquake itself. Um, a lot of people don't think of Palestine and Israel as an active earthquake zone. Um, but actually it very much is. The Jordan Valley um, the jo is, is a part of the a Rift Valley. It's part of, it's effectively the most northerly end of what is known as the Great African Rift Valley, which isn't really a single um, valley. It's more of a, a, a series of tectonic faults, earthquake producing faults, which runs up the Eastern side of Africa and ends pretty much in Lebanon and Syria. So just north of the area that we're talking about. And this is um, a map and a little bit of information on this particular earthquake. This was one of roughly speaking, um, one reasonable sized earthquake that happens every century or so in Palestine Israel, the Levant, the region that we're talking about here, um, obviously under many different names over time. Um, so certainly as far as it can be traced through different kinds of records over the past 2000 years or so, there have been, there's been, there's been an earthquake of reasonable size, obviously interspersed with lots of smaller ones, um, approximately every century. Um, so we are kind of coming up to one being due right now. Um, the previous big one um, in the 19th century killed a lot more people than this, probably around 5,000. Most of the damage was centred further north than this example, um, particularly um, around the town of Safed, um, which is um, in, in what is now northern Israel. Uh, the 1927 earthquake happened um, just after three o'clock in the afternoon. It had its epicentre in the northwest of the Dead Sea, although at the time it was thought to be further north, um, the, the Dead Sea uh, location is something that's very much been um, discovered by researchers in the last couple of decades. And at least 287 people were killed. 287 is the official figure. The majority of those are in the city of Nablus, in what is now the West Bank, um, a bit north of the area that's covered by the main map here. You can see it in the smaller map um, up in the corner. Um, but other places where there were significant fatalities include towns like Ramla, um, Alod, uh, Tiberia, Tiberias, um, a village called Raina in the Galilee, which is almost entirely destroyed. And it's not clear why they suffered quite so badly. 
Jerusalem itself, and also on the other side of the Rift Valley, um, the town of Assalt in Transjordan. Um, and the number of buildings that are seriously destroyed or need to be demolished because of damage certainly runs well into the thousands and thousands of people are displaced. Um, a lot of them end up, for instance, in, in kind of tented refugee cities, at least for a few weeks, if not months afterwards. Fairly rapidly after the earthquake takes place, the um, chief secretary to the government of Palestine, who is effectively in charge of Palestine at this point, because the high commissioner, Lord Plumer, is out of the country, issues a call for aid. And this call for aid is published as a charitable appeal, similar to the kinds of things that we would uh, see in, 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 in the modern day when the Disasters Relief Committee um, puts out an appeal because there's a, a famine or an earthquake or something. And there is a great emphasis in Symes's thinking on uh, uh, organization, rationalization, um, preventing overlapping and waste in, in one of these phrases. And there is a board appointed to manage the funds that come in from all over the world. Um, uh, and the members of this board um, are drawn from a mixture of government officials headed by George Antonius, who uh, is still a, a Palestine mandate um, administration official at this point in time, and also leading figures from both the Arab and Jewish communities in Palestine. So there is obviously an attempt going on to incorporate various different parts of the community and to um, put forward an idea of balance. And the main way in which um, we know about what happened with the, uh, the Relief Fund um, appeal is that the newspapers published the lists of donors um, initially in the first sort of couple of months. This is up to a couple of times a week. Um, the number, the, the, these lists were first uh, published in the official gazette of the administration of the uh, mandate administration, and were also um, published in Arabic and Hebrew in the different language newspapers in Palestine. And the way in which these are published kind of um, has various different dynamics. Um, it sets up what I think we might well see as um, a, a kind of competition to be seen to donate um, from different uh, communities to be seen to have done their bit. Um, and what we therefore start to witness um, quite fascinatingly is a very, very wide range of donations. So for instance, on the lists that we've got here, we for instance have ladies from Bethlehem resident in South America via the mayor of Bethlehem. So there are communities uh, from the large uh, Levantine diaspora in um, the Americas who send in money, often via church organizations. There are major companies in the region. For instance, we've got the Standard Oil Company of Beirut via the Brumana Tennis Club. So that's from Lebanon. We have religious organizations and religious community organizations. So uh, there are lots of um, Islamic and Jewish and Christian groups from uh, particularly from Europe and America and also from around the region. And then we also see kind of high profile figures also sending in money. So quite early on, one of the people listed is the, 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 the sort of veteran Egyptian politician Saad Zaghloul, who sends in a sum, um, and this is only days or weeks before he dies. Um, but we see a, a great um, mixture of different uh, communities and different sets of how people choose to um, describe themselves as well when they send in um, uh, their donations. However, um, there are a certain amount of uh, assumptions that go into who has been affected by the earthquake and whether they therefore need these donations. So, when uh, Symes is um, 
sent a cable very, very quickly, just a couple of days after the earthquake, which kicks off this, uh, the, the, the idea of there being a kind of mass um, call for donations. It's, bar, it's because of a donation from Nathan Strauss, who was uh, an American Jewish businessman, um, I think founder of the Sachs, I think, um, uh, chain of, of, of department stores. And he had he 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 was a regular donor to causes in Palestine, um, and he tended to stipulate very clearly that he wasn't just donating to Jewish causes. Um, often he did donate to to to, to, to Jewish calls uh, for support, but he always made it very clear that he was donating to to a, a, a kind of general Palestine, which included Arabs. Um, and so we have this phrase, irrespective, irrespective of their community or creed. Um, and also a focus on the idea that relief should be spent on the sort of immediate emergency. So tents, food, people who, are, who have lost their homes um, and on emergency medical care, rather than on reconstruction, um, particularly of public buildings. There is also, however, a strong um, theme throughout Symes's and other official paperwork um, uh, around the donations and around the casualties of the earthquake, that it is mainly Muslim, i.e. Palestinian Arab Muslim, um, people who are uh, most um, affected by this. Now, numerically, to some extent, this is true. Um, Nablus, in particular, uh, is primarily, and, and, and for a long time has been, primarily um, uh, an Islamic population. Although, for instance, Raina, the village that I mentioned earlier, was largely Christian. Um, and there is an idea that the Jew, as can, we can see here in some of the quotes, that the Jewish population didn't suffer in the earthquake, um, that relief is therefore not required for Jews. Um, and if we look further into some of the paperwork of the, uh, the, the, of the internal paperwork within the administration, what emerges is that there is an idea amongst British officials that Arabs, and there's a lot of scare quotes that you can't see me making here, but that Arabs live in traditional, primitive, badly built and or badly maintained houses that tend to collapse and kill people in the earthquake. And this is laid out particularly, for instance, in a report by an earthquake uh, specialist called Bailey Willis from America, who happens to rock up in Palestine the day after the earthquake. Um, and he says that the sort of traditional, what he calls traditional buildings, like the one that you can see here that collapsed, um, are built of, inner and outer facings of stone with an internal core of rubble and that these are very heavy and that because the inner and outer faces are not tied together they um, all of this is more likely to collapse and he this is characterized with the idea that this is a, a traditional Arab Muslim style of building whereas Jews are perceived as living in modern um, better built, European, stronger, more resilient housing. Um, this is a, an aspect of things that I am going into in my current research more deeply in association with some specialists in earthquake architecture. And certainly what I can say from the preliminaries of that is that the situation is much, much more complicated. Um, I'm sure that won't surprise you. Um, those assumptions are also, to a significant extent, demonstrably wrong, particularly in the case of Jerusalem, because what we see in Jerusalem later on are the records of who applied for loans uh, from the government um, in order to help rebuild their houses. And if we look at those numbers, even allowing for the fact, uh, even allowing for the, 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 the nature of the population in Jerusalem at the time, it's at least as many Jewish households as Muslim or uh, Christian ones, Arab ones generally, who apply for grants and loans 
to help. So certainly that kind of assumption is wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, one of the answers might well be that the, the racialized, the stereotyped ideas that the British mandate officials often have about the populations in Palestine is much too simplistic. And we see that in the, the, the kind of case study that I'm now going to present. And this case study came from uh, a rather serendipitous find in the um, couple of weeks of archive research that I managed to get in before lockdown happened last year. And this is from a set of letters um, within the London, the institutions of the London Jewish communities um, regarding the appeal. Um, and it is kicked off by a letter from Rabbi um, Jacob or Yaqub Meir, who is the head of the Jerusalem Sephardic community at this time. So he um, is a senior member of the Sephardic community within Palestine. Um, and he writes to the oldest Jewish community, uh, Jewish congregation, sorry, in Britain, the Spanish and Portuguese um, congregation at Bevis Marx Synagogue in London. Um, and the secretary of, the, of that congregation at the time is a man called Paul Goodman. So we see here that Paul Goodman receives this letter from Rabbi Meir saying that um, the community in Jerusalem hasn't received any of the money that they feel they uh, requested, are entitled to from their co-religionists. So not just Jews, but Sephardic Jews in London um, they're pretty confident that money has been sent from the congregation in London, but that they haven't been supported by it. Um, and Goodman is understandably concerned about this. Now, Goodman um, has been part of the fundraising effort and quite a lot of money has been sent from this particular congregation in London via the bank account of the Board of Deputies of British Jews. Um, to the appeal, uh, but this is the general appeal, which has specifically been laid out as not giving money to communities, but to individuals, regardless, irrespective of their um, community or creed. Um, this sets off a, a kind of a chain of concern within the, the various institutions in London. Um, they're worried, obviously, by this, um, by this report that Jews have not received what they feel to be their fair share of the very considerable contributions that they know have been made. Um, and there is a, a kind of a, a flurry of um, concerns about what's going on here. Um, and as we can see in these letters between Goodman and Jack Rich, the secretary of the Board of Deputies, um, there are various different um, versions and perceptions going on um, according to where, what money has been sent uh, and what, those destination, what the destination of these donations has actually been. Um, and while they are certainly um, keen to emphasize that they're not expecting all their money to go to Jewish victims of the earthquake. They do feel that they, that, that, that they want to know that the that Jewish victims have been properly looked after and that they're not being downgraded in terms of their importance in uh, the claims. This series of letters, um, once it uh, kind of reaches a certain level of concern, results in a uh, an inquiry by Goodman and Rich to Harry Vitellas. Now, Harry Vitellas is both um, uh, the, re the, um, the representative of the joint, the Joint Distribution Committee, which is a very major American um, Jewish charity in terms of its membership and uh, fundraising uh, activities in the States, but it's not Jewish in the sense of the, um, 
uh, the causes that it supports. It's a, it's a general relief charity. Um, and Vitellez um, also handles a lot of the finances for other uh, charitable um, initiatives within Palestine. Um, he's a very senior figure in, in, in kind of aid finance in um, Jerusalem at this point in time. And he goes to Edwin Samuel, who has taken over um, some of the administration of the donation fund in Jerusalem um, by the beginning of 1938, uh, sorry, 1928, so the year after the, so this is, this is four or five months after the earthquake happened, sorry, it's five or six months after the earthquake happened. And Vitellas um, inquires to Samuel what's, what's going on here, why are the Sephardic community in Jerusalem um, unhappy, uh, and um, what's, the, uh, what's the problem here? Edwin Samuel, son of Herbert Samuel, the first High Commissioner of Palestine, um, is by this time a reasonably senior administrator within the mandate um, government. And he very much takes, continues to take, like the Board of Deputies and the Spanish and Portuguese um, synagogue, the line that donations are entirely down to need um, rather than um, any kind of specific communities receiving more or less, that Jews will receive um, uh, the, any loans or, or grants that they apply for um, if they, are, they have the need for them. Um, and he very, gives a very uh, close breakdown of very specific numbers um, of uh, money that have been doled out within Jerusalem, primarily in loans for individual households to rebuild. Um, these are given in Egyptian pounds. Um, and that at least a third has gone to not just Jewish, but to Sephardic families. Um, and that the rest of that has gone to Ashkenazi Jews and to um, Christian and Muslim Arabs. So he very much sets out that this is a fair division um, and that the complaints of the Sephardic community are, are incorrect, um, uh, that they don't have um, a cause for complaint. He specifies that perhaps this is a confusion that has come out of the fact that um, the Sephardic community did lose quite, uh, suffer quite a lot of damage of its public buildings. Um, so of a yeshiva, of um, a synagogue, and also um, one of their hospitals. But what he clarifies is that, as with all of the other communities, none of the fund is used for repairing public buildings. Um, it's to be used for housing homeless families, and then in loans and grants um, for individual householders to rebuild their damaged homes. Um, and this is something that, that does apply um, across the rest of the mandate. The mandate authorities pay for the repair of government buildings, um, the railway system repair, pay for the repair of railway buildings. And in terms of individuals, they, are, um, they, they basically have to apply for this loan system. As soon as they receive this letter from Samuel, uh, Rich and Goodman kind of seem to be almost embarrassed by the fact that they've asked. Um, they seem to feel that um, there's been, that they've been made to look as if they are unreasonable and as if they are trying to beg favoritism on behalf of the Sephardic community um, and that they've been sort of almost caught out by Vitellas and Samuel by this and so this results um, in the issue almost being kind of kicked upstairs to the president of the board of deputies who says in another of the letters in this correspondence that he is sorry that Vitello sent the letter to Samuel he he it, it had been hoped that this was going to continue um, and stay as an internal discussion um, and, and and feels that he needs to sort of issue this emphasis that um, everything should be impartial, everything should be completely down to um, need, and there was, quote, no intention of earmarking our contributions for the relief of the Jewish community. So how do I think we should read this particular incident? Um, I think what the administration internal documents show us is that the British have this view of Arabs and Jews as being two very separate 
um, specific entities um, with certain characteristics um, in quite a racialized way that Arabs are oriental primitive, they can't manage themselves, um, and versus Jews who have um, modern technological homes, which means that they don't need in, as much help in this situation. Um, I think we also need to look at the fact that the Sephardic Jewish community in the holy cities in Palestine, so Safad and Tiberias, as well as Jerusalem, had a very long history throughout the Ottoman period of relationships of support, financial support coming from communities in the European and Central Asian and even uh, kind of going as far as America and, and Hong Kong and Singapore of donations for the religious communities in Palestine. And whilst most of that network had disintegrated by that time, I think in people like Rabbi Mir, we see a kind of continu continuity um, similar to the sort of things that Salim Tamari has talked about within other communities, a kind of continuity of thought and assumptions and sort of institutional memory about what maybe can be asked for. I think what it also shows is that at this point in time, the Zionist movement is still very much um, uh, kind of sticking with this um, idea that upbuilding Palestine is the job of everybody there, and that includes um, Arabs, and that they um, can't uh, um, allocate money to separate communities in a case like this, because they need to show that they are building up the entire country of Palestine in an impartial kind of way. Um, and that there is also a sense in which the Sephardic community have kind of fallen in between the gaps of, uh, of um, the, uh, the concepts of race that the British have, and that they've also then fallen between gaps um, in shifts from the 19th to the 20th century of community-based models of charity to uh, a much more sort of global idea of humanitarianism, which is also combined with um, the Zionist idea of um, upbuilding Palestine and also the, the kind of the, the rhetoric of organizations like the League of Nations um, at this point in time. So when we have this racialized idea from the British of what a Jew and what an Arab look like in Palestine, there are multiple examples that show us that that idea doesn't work. And this kind of little micro historical case, um, looking at the uh, Sephardic community and their experience of the earthquake in 1927, I think shows the way in which these racialized ideas that the British come to Palestine with don't work and that people and groups of people fall between these gaps when there is a kind of crisis like this and they feel that they are being excluded, left out, um, not treated fairly um, in uh, an emergency environment. And that's me. Um, this is a picture of Jews in Jerusalem who have suffered from the earthquake. Um, according to the National Library of Israel, these are, um, these are Sephardim. Um, and so I think this is just a nice image to end on in terms of uh, showing what, what the kind of individuals we're talking about actually look like. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I think we now have Q&A. Shannon? Thank you very much for that, Dr. Irvin. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions now, so if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Thank you. Um, do you want me to read them out to you, or would you like to read them yourself? Um, do you want to read them out just so that everybody's not having to listen to me the whole time? Yeah, I don't mind. Because that's um, quite boring. <laughs> so we've got two from Andrew. He says, Sarah, thanks for an absolutely fascinating paper. Two questions on the British imperial side of things. So this first. How conscious are Symes and others of earlier British imperial humanitarian interventions like that in Syria in 1860? Mm -hmm. And then, okay, 
Sorry, okay, shall I take that one first and then we do yeah, the yeah. second one? Um, so certainly in terms of what um, can be seen in the in the uh, mandate um, archives, not particularly aware. Um, Symes is very much uh, a colonial administrator. He spends pretty much his entire life doing this and he does it in lots of different places. Um, uh, so he, he, when he leaves, um, I'm trying to remember where, where he goes. It might be Yemen, actually. He might have been, he might, he might be the one that's in my head who ends up um, uh, running Arden for a while. Um, but they very much, the mandate administration um, don't really talk about other examples in their discussions of what, of what they're going to do in this case. Um, and I think in, ter in terms of um, in terms of interventions earlier on, um, yes, obviously those are British imperial interventions, but they're not they're not the governing power at this time, obviously, as you know. Um, so I think they very much I think want to um, draw. Uh, I suspect they very much kind of want to draw a distinction between catastrophes that happened under the Ottomans, which I think they would probably want to present as being sort of poorly managed and chaotic and things, and this focus that they very much have in the way that Symes and Samuels and other people talk about this case of wanting to be very, very, um, we're organised, we're impartial, we are um, rational, um, we are efficient, um, uh, that's that's a lot of the language that's happening. They don't they don't talk about um, other cases almost at all um, in any of the archival material. And then to your second question, to what extent do they draw on more recent precedents um, and particularly the India um, examples of fam famine and also um, earthquake um, again there's no specific mention of other examples, um, which I think in some ways is very interesting. Um, and it, and it, it, was, it was talking to a colleague in Sweden who had done her PhD on the way that the British administration in India dealt with um, earthquakes that kind of triggered the idea of this whole project in my head. But um, I think there's a kind of Palestine exceptionalism going on in the heads of the British mandate authorities here um, in the way that they issue the appeal. Um, and that is kind of something where they, they very much, although on one level they're talking about um, things being impartial and this not being about sect and religion and communities, the way, of course, that they actually operate all of this very much is so the, the the channels through which they go to issue the the appeal um, when we see um, the appeals being made in newspapers in Britain, for instance, Symes and 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 other, and other people within the administration have obviously cabled. Um, uh, their contacts in the Jewish community, particularly in the UK, to say write to the um, write to the papers and 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 make this appeal, um, and that leads to all sorts of other kind of interesting dynamics as well. So there are there are appeal letters a appear in the Times on the same day. One of them from the Jewish um, community, and one of them from this really strange sort of conservative. Um, anti-Jewish, anti-communist, pro sort of Arab monarchy organization in Britain um, that is founded by some former suffragettes. So there, are, there's, there's lots of kind of odd angles that then go on in terms of the fundraising effort in the UK as well. Um, and there's a lot of blurring between the this sort of charitable, the, the fact that the government is sort of denying responsibility for reconstruction um, of, of, of damage from the earthquake, whilst also um, being very, very involved in running this charitable appeal, although 
trying to maintain an idea that the charitable appeal is kind of independent of the mandate administration. Um, so yes, I don't know if that's answered your question. Um, uh, I, I, there's a bit of a ramble, but um, the, sh the very short answer is no, um, but in some odd ways. Uh, so thank you for that. I was just wondering if uh, Andrew would like to make a comment on that. Uh, unmuted if you'd like to talk now. But if not, that's fine. We can move on. Uh, I think we'll just move on and come back to him if he does want to say anything. So the next question is from Jeff and he says, were British responses to the earthquake influenced by the restrictions on Jewish immigration? Influenced by the restrictions on Jewish immigration. Um, the, the interaction between um, the earthquake and events in 1927 generally and British policy on immigration is, is a bit interesting because um, this is also the point in time at which um, there is huge unemployment in amongst particularly the um, Jewish kind of recent immigrant community in Palestine. So in parallel sets of records of the mandate administration, there are also kind of files talking about the need for food relief and um, kind of maintenance relief for unemployed Jewish people, particularly in Tel Aviv and Haifa and Jaffa. Um, so I don't think British responses to the earthquake are specifically influenced by their immigration policy, but it does influence some of their relationships, for instance, with, um, with potential donors because for instance, um, the joint, the joint distribution committee, this major American, um, this major American Jew sort of Jewish focused charity, they offer earthquake relief, including via Felix Vorberg. Um, and what Symes says is no, thank you, because we've got money coming in from lots of other places for this. And actually we'd rather, if the joint is going to do relief uh, in Palestine, that it um, does unemployment relief instead, because the British are actually worried at this point in time um, that because of the level of unemployment amongst Jewish immigrants, they're going to have to clamp down on immigration, they're going to have to cut numbers, that this is going to be politically unpopular, um, but that politically they might be forced to do so if they, because they can't be seen to give too much dull charity to these unemployed populations unless they do the same for unemployed Arabs. So there is, there's certainly a kind of intermingling of policy going on, but it's not so much that the earthquake response are influenced by restrictions on Jewish immigration. It's more that there are kind of politics going on behind the scenes around where they want money to come from and then who they're going to disperse it to. Um, and then Sari's question. Shannon, do you want to read that off? Yeah, so um, Sari's just saying, I was wondering if you've come across any information regarding questions of class across confessional divides and the impacts of financial distribution. Um, I've not come across much clear class analysis per se. Um, there are certain assumptions from the British that as well as the relief effort sort of in the longer rebuilding effort, particularly rebuilding of public uh, buildings like churches um, uh, and mosques and synagogues, that, that it will be the sort of elite of the various different um, communities who will kind of spearhead that level of rebuilding happening. Um, 
in terms of financial distribution, there's obviously some kind of um, some complicated things going on there in terms of the fact that, I mean, if we think about Ottoman Palestine, you know, these all of the working class and peasant populations in Palestine have a historical reluctance to hand over personal information to the state because of the fact that it may well be used for conscription and or tax. And in order to get these loans, as we have to with a loan nowadays, they have to hand over quite a, a sort of intrusive amount of personal information. And obviously that is something that ends up being a class question because it's the people who possibly historically felt most reluct uh, reluctant to hand over information because they were the most vulnerable in these terms who have to do that. So there are certainly class dynamics in terms of some of the financial distribution um, in this sense that um, uh, if you want to get money, you have to conform to certain demands from the state. And I, I think, I haven't kind of managed to do enough um, research on this yet, but I kind of get a sense that if we're thinking about the operation of the state in Palestine and the shift from the Ottoman to the colonial period and the way in which sort of modern Weberian bureaucratic states intervene in people's lives, then this is almost sort of one of a, a kind of key example here in that this is a point at which if people want support from the state, they have to effectively exchange that for the kind of information that the state can then potentially use against them in the future. Um, and you know, and we, we also see kind of a mixture of, I would, I would say kind of class and these more sort of racial confessional kind of stereotypes in the way that kind of the loan applications are made um, and assessed. Um, so some of the some of the applications come in like a decade later when it may be that these are genuine legitimate earthquake damage that people have, for instance, had a building. And this they made they mainly countryside ones, these that these are talking about, that, that people um, have a building that had got damaged in the earthquake, but they didn't want to use it, and then their family has expanded later on and they want to bring it back into use. And so they kind of send these loan requests in years and years later, saying, This is earthquake damage, please can I have you know one of these, one of these grants? Um, and are denied them on the grounds that um, you know, this is this is ages ago, you must be faking it. Um, but obviously, again, there's sort of questions around why they're assumed to be faking it, who it is that's making these applications, and how those applications are then treated. Mm -hmm.